And everybody say, amen. amen. When Junior Church gets back there, we'll have a quick prayer real quick together before you guys go on up. And Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for our kids that are going up to the Junior Church. Be with the teachers. Bless them. Let it be a time of blessing through your word there. Let it be a time of blessing through, all, through the word with us together uh, right now, Father. Uh, we thank you of that song, Waymaker. And you are always working, Father. And we know Romans 8.28 stands true to this day that you work all things together for good, Father, to them that love God, to them called according to your purpose. Father, we just thank you that you are always working even when we don't see it and we don't, uh, in some sense, uh, acknowledge it at this point. But, Father, we, I know you're working. You're always working. And, Father, we know that you want all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and that's your desire and in, in, in your heart and love to a, a broken world. We thank you for uh, Jesus Christ and everything he has accomplished on the cross for us. That through his death, his burial, and resurrection, we can forgive his sins and eternal life. And what a privilege it is to serve you and to be in, uh, called a child of God, to be an ambassador for Christ. And that we're part of what you're doing. And that we can share your wonderful uh, grace, the gospel of the grace of God to the lost. So, Father, be with us today as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Amen. amen. Go ahead and turn your, to your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to be in verse, uh, verses uh, 20 to 22. It's a human error on the screen. It's 20 to 22 today. And I titled today, Not I, But He. One of the things... As a parent, as I try to teach my children, uh, lots of things, obviously, uh, learn from my mistakes in a lot of ways, but as they play sports, and one thing I really enjoy as a father is really just being involved with my kids' lives and uh, in the extracurricular activities, and one thing that they're involved with is sports, and playing basketball and soccer and baseball and, and softball and such, and I love doing it, and one thing, though, I try to... Um, teach them is that it's not all about them. It's not about you. It's just not about you when you play sports. It's, it's not just all about them. And it's, uh, in, in all reality, and may I say this, it's, it's, not even about, uh, it's not even about playing together as a team. Although it's key. It's, it's key to in, in winning games and winning championships and such, playing as a team. But what I, what I try to instill in my children and try to teach them is that uh, the most important thing is using the gift that God has given them. Get using the gift that God has given them. See, you and I, God has blessed each and every single one of us here in many different ways, in many different gifts, talents. And God wants us to give Him the honor and glory and, and use those gifts for that uh, purpose. But we, we see everything, the reality of it is we have to have that knowledge and understanding that every gift, everything, okay, everything that we have is because it's a gift from God. That's what the Bible tells us in many different verses, but I have a verse up here for us all. Every good gift and every per perfect gift is what? From above. And it cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. But see, the question arises, how do we get to the point of in living our life with that reality? Right? How do we get to that point in that reality in living the fact that every good, everything that comes from it, it's a gift from God. Our children are a gift from God, right? Our local church is a gift for us. Your wife, your spouse, your husband is a is a gift from God. The job you have is a gift. The money you have it's it's of God. You come into this world with nothing, and you leave the world with what? Nothing, right? So how do we get to that point in living our life with, the rea with that reality? How do we approach things the way God desires for us to approach things? Well, we have to take ourselves out of the equation. We have to take ourselves out of the equation. It has to stop being only about what we want, but what He wants for us. The acknowledgement that every good gift is, comes from above, it's God's gift, it's, and we need to quit wanting what we want and focus on what God desires for you and I. And I believe we have the perfect passage today in Colossians 1, verse 20, 
20 and on, I believe this is a perfect passage in front of us today that will help us with this. This passage today will help us see that it's not I, but who? But he. And that's going to be a very common theme today. It's not I, but he. Which brings me to our first point today. It's not I, but he that what? Has made peace. Read it with me in verse 20 in Colossians 1 verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. If it's not I but he that has made peace. And listen, verse 19 starts and says, For it pleased the Father that in him shall all fullness dwell. All fullness dwells in him. He is everything. Without him we have what? Nothing. Verse 20 then goes on with says, We have he has made peace through the blood of his cross. There are those who again. There are those who would like to make this blanket statement, and maybe you've heard it, maybe you've heard this once or twice. People have said this, I made peace with God a long time ago, and he knows where I stand. Right? You've heard that one before, right? I've made peace with God a long time ago, and he knows where I stand. Listen, the Bible says this, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. The Father made peace through the blood of whose, whose cross? The Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you heard it before, maybe you haven't, but it's definitely a ridiculous statement to say. And let me tell you why. Because the Bible says so. The Bible tells you so. He made the peace. That's what it says. Now what did he make this peace? Why did he make this peace? Right? What did he do to make this peace? Well, through the blood of, his, of the cross. That through the shed blood that Christ shed on that cross for, for us, through the cross, he made peace. He made peace. Peace through the blood of his cross. It's such a tremendous, many passages of scripture. Therefore being justified by what? Faith. We have what? Peace with God through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. The only reason we have peace is, is because of who? The Lord Jesus. You can't make peace. God, the Lord Jesus Christ is that peace, but he's made that peace for you and I. It's through the blood of his cross that we have Peace. It's nothing that you and I have done. It's everything that he has accomplished. Not I, but he. Even Hebrews 9.22 tells us, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without what? Shedding of blood is no what? Remission. See, the Lord Jesus Christ was the all-sufficient sacrifice for you and I. And we're going to get to this in the next verse in 21. But the point that God through the Apostle Paul makes to us is that we don't make the peace. He made the peace. He made the peace. That's why Romans 15, 33 tells us this. Now the God of what? Peace be with you all. Amen. He made the peace. And it's because of the cross that all things, all things in heaven and earth are reconciled by under the authority and headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, that's what this verse is saying. By the blood of his cross. But, but what the Lord Jesus Christ did on that cross, everything in heaven and earth is under the authority and headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a what? Above all principality, power, might, dominion, everything that's named, right? Because of the cross. It's because of the cross that all the position of rank and authority in earthly and heavenly places are under his authority. And listen, the, the cross that was meant to kill and give Satan the victory, the cross was meant to produce evil. That's what he intended. It was this cross that God meant for what? Good. It was this cross that the Lord Jesus Christ made an open display of his awesomeness to Satan and all of his fallen comrades. Go to Colossians 2, verse 15. He made an open statement. He was, he triumphantly, he opened, he, he was proud of it. He made an open display of his awesomeness to Satan and his comrades. The, 
Look what he says in Colossians 2.15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a what? Show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. It's interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ is not backwards about the cross, is he? He's not shy in, in sharing about what he did, what, what was he? He, he died on the cross. What Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. And Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. That through his death, his burial, and resurrection, we can forgive his sin eternal life. No, he, death could not hold him down. He was risen again. And he was not ashamed of that. That's why Paul says in Romans 16, For I am not a what? Ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation. Lord Jesus Christ wasn't ashamed of it, and neither should you and I. He made an open display of it. He, 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 he's, the, the ridiculousness of everything that Satan and them thought that they could control, they couldn't. He's messing around with the wrong person, the wrong, the wrong guy, the wrong. He, messed, he was messing with God. And you see, if Satan, and this is one important thing too, if Satan would have known what he now knows, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He would not have crucified the Lord of glory, which none of the princes of this world, verse 1 Corinthians 2, 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so it's because of the cross that all the position of rank and authority in earthly and heavenly places are under his authority. Christ is above all. Above all of it. And you and I as members of the body of Christ, we are in the beloved. We are complete in Christ. And where does that make us? Right beside. We're joint heirs with Christ. It's amazing grace. Isn't it? And so it's because of the cross that all position of rank and authority in earthly and heavenly places are under his authority. He says he made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. You see, the earthly rank and authority deals with the, with the nation of Israel. That's one thing we have to understand dispensationally here. When he talks about everything, all the position of rank and authority, all that dealing is dealing with the nation of Israel. Look at the promise he made to the nation of Israel. Going to be, there's going to be a kingdom on earth, a literal kingdom. And the 12 apostles are going to be what? Sitting on 12 thrones, judging the what? 12 tribes of Israel. Earthly rank here and authority deals with the nation of Israel. And the heavenly rank and authority deals with who? The body of Christ. That's why, turn, you're in Colossians. Go to the book, book of Ephesians to the left. That's why in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, verse 15. That's something, the body of Christ's truth, the mystery. If Satan would have known what God was going to do through the body of Christ, having, having a heavenly home, and they're gonna, we're going to fill up those, that, the position of rank and authority... Everything that the, it's basic, it's, they lost it. We're taking all those positions. But look what, and Paul says, I want you to know this stuff. I want you to have information. I want you, I'm praying that you, that you are, have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge in him, verse 17. He goes, I want your eyes to, to be opened. I want your eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. This is what he did. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to who? The church. Defines what the church is, verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that what? Filleth all in all. All of us, all God's children, in the, in the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ, we're going to fill all in all in all the heavenly places. And Christ is the head of the body of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Sharing his awesomeness and his glory throughout all ages to come. 
It says heavenly rank, what he says in Colossians 1, the cross, he put it all under his authority and headship. And yet, God has a plan for us as the body of Christ, the heavenly home, but his, his plan with the nation of Israel will still occur. He set them aside for a season, ushering in the dispensation of grace, throwing in the Apostle Paul to usher in, to be dispensed the grace message, to share the glorious message of the, of the gospel, the grace of God, that we're a new creature, a heavenly creature, seated in heavenly places. Everything that we don't deserve, but it's only by God's grace alone, that what? We can be saved through what? Faith. All these positions are under his authority. That's why Ephesians 1, you're already in Ephesians. But in Ephesians 1, he says, Then in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. God's got a plan for the nation of Israel, an earthly home, and God's got a plan for the body of Christ, a heavenly home. And there's position of rank and authority in both places. That's what Colossians is dealing with here when he says in verse 16, Colossians 1, all things that you see here, you see, they're in heaven. The, the earth is visible, the, and heaven's invisible. There's thrones here, there's dominions, there's principalities, there's powers, there's, you know, all things are created by him and what? For him. The cross put it all... <laughs> Because of the cross, it reconciled all things unto himself. That he has taken now possession. He is now has authority of it all. And guess what Satan has authority of anything? He has nothing. Nothing at all. That's why all he can do today in Ephesians 6 tells us the word to keep standing. But all he can do is try to what? Deceive. He can throw trickery, fiery darts at us, deceiving, lying. He works in the... In the, in the he works behind pulpits, folks. He creates false doctrine. Okay? He, 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 works, and he, he works behind individuals that want to say that salvation is not free. That you've got to get baptized to get, be saved. That you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and you've got, you got to do works. You've got to give more money. You've got to pray more. You've got to come to church more. You've got to do this. What does God's word say? For by grace are we saved through what? Faith. Not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. He put it all under his headship. It's all under him because of the cross. He made peace. He's the one who has made peace. All positions in the ages to come will have God's people in those positions and also God's angels, the good angels. And each person, go back to Colossians 1. Each saved person is a victory over the devil and the nail in his coffin, by the way. It's a nail in his coffin. Each saved person, each, and this is what, Colossians 1, 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us into the kingdom of what? His dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Each time an individual accepts Christ as their personal savior, that just that makes Satan angry. Because he wants to take every single person with him to hell. Because that's where he's headed. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. Don't you ever forget it. And he wants to take every single person with him that he can. But we have the gospel, the grace of God to share with the lost. And it's very clear. Christ died on the cross for our sins. That through his death, burial, and resurrection, you can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And you don't have to spend eternity in hell forever and ever in torture. You can spend eternity with who? The Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever in heaven, in paradise. And so listen here. As Colossians 1 tells us, it's not I, but it's He. He's the one who made the peace. He is Lord of all. He reconciled all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And don't ever forget this verse in Romans 14, 9. Tremendous. For to this end Christ both what? Died and rose and revived that he might be what? Lord. Don't ever forget that part. Yes, he loves us. Yes, he died on the cross for our sins. But the first and foremost is that he is Lord. Lord of lords and what? Kings of kings. We're part of what God is doing. 
Praise God He loves us so much, right? It's not I, but He. It's but He who offers salvation also to us all. Verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath what? He reconciled. Yet now hath he reconciled. Not I, but he who offers salvation. It is he that has provided reconciliation for us. That is who has provided reconciliation for us. And it's our responsibility to accept that reconciliation. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if you're in Colossians or in Ephesians, it's to the left. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if you know where Galatians was, because Sean was in Galatians, it's to the left of that as well. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. He has provided reconciliation for us. And it's our responsibility to accept the reconciliation. Verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, what? Be ye reconciled to God. It's not I, but he that loved us first. God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. He's reconciled the world unto himself, but you have to receive that gift. You have to receive the gift. That's why he says, be ye reconciled to God. You and I have the message of reconciliation. We're ambassadors for Christ. You can go to anybody, anywhere, and tell them about the glorious gospel, the grace of God, that Christ loves them, that he died on the cross for their sins, that through his death, his burden, and resurrection, you can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And you can say, be ye reconciled to God. Accept the gift of eternal life. Before it is eternally too late. It's not I but he that has loved us first, right? God reached us. Right? It's not us. It's him. It's he that loved us first. 1 John 4.19 We love him because what? He first loved us. Looking at our spiritual condition, he reached out to us and he's offering us salvation. That's why in Romans 5, 8, he says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and what? That while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. It's not I, but he that offers salvation for free. And we already hit upon it. But I want to hit upon this, and people who are watching on television or listening on radio, look at this verse on the screen. And so many people struggle with the, the reality that it's totally free. It's salvation is free. It's nothing that you can do. And this verse hammers at home. This is God's word, not Aaron's words or not your words. These are God's words. And look what he says. For by grace are what? You save through faith. And I underlined it for you. In that what? Not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. And the next verse, not of works. Lest any man should boast. It's not I, but he that saves. In Christ alone, by faith alone. That's why he, he, 1 Timothy, go to 1 Timothy real quick. That's why in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, God's desire is that he wants all men to be saved and what? To come unto the knowledge of the truth. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 5 is a tremendous verse for us all and for someone who's struggling. Maybe, hasn't accept, maybe has not accepted Christ as their personal Savior. Maybe they think it's a work, and maybe they think it's, it's something that they have to do. they got to go to somebody. they got to go to a preacher. they got to go to some minister, whatever the case is. This is what it is. 1 Timothy 2, 4. God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man who? Christ Jesus. It's in Christ alone, 
by faith alone. I can't save you. No other person can save you. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can save you. In Christ alone, by faith alone, it's not I but He that saves. It's not I but what? Who? He. He's the one that made peace. He's the one that's Lord of all. It's not I but He who offers salvation. Salvation to all in Christ alone, by faith alone. And listen, it's not I but He who can make us what? Righteous. It's He that makes us righteous. Go back to Colossians 1. Colossians 1. It's He who makes us righteous. Colossians 1 verse 22. In the body of His flesh through death. To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You were then sometimes alienated enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. How did he do it? In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. It's not I but he that makes us righteous. It's through the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, that took our sins and washed them away. Our sins were what? Imputed to Him. He put it on His account. And then through our belief in the cross and what He's done for us, our belief in Him and what He has accomplished on the cross for us, we receive the imputation of Jesus Christ. That He makes us righteous. The cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, is what makes us righteous. He's what what makes us holy. He's what makes us acceptable, unblameable and unreprovable in the God the Father's sight. 2 Corinthians 5.21, I have it on the screen for you. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we what? Might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And if you don't say amen, I don't know what's going to not make you say amen. Think about this. Think about this verse. I want you to reflect on this verse real quick. When you read, when I read scripture, I always like, Lord, help me to understand it. Help me to, to maybe try to explain it. But at the same time, also to reflect. And to really know and try to understand in my finite mind your word. In the body of his flesh through death. Think about this. Not I, but he. Men took Christ. They spit in his face. They pulled his hair and his beard. They smote him with rods. They scourged him. They buffeted him. They crowned him with thorns. They put a robe on him and a reed in his hand for a scepter and what? Mocked him. Made fun of him. And they chose to free a murderer. And then screamed, crucify him, crucify him. And they did. It's not I, but what? But he who made the peace and is Lord of all. It's not I, but he who offers salvation. Salvation to all in Christ alone by what? Faith alone. And it's not I, but he who makes us righteous. Not I, but he who chose to love us from eternity past and paved the way for eternal life for us. If we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Have you accepted that free gift of salvation? Are you ready for the Lord's return? Are you ready for all eternity? If you can't answer those questions, it's very quite simple. The gospel is very clear. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He died for you on that cross. He was buried and He rose again the third day. You believe in what He has done for you, you can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And if you still have questions, and if you're listening here or you're sitting here and you don't know, well, death will take you. Do not 
leave these doors. Because you have no idea. If you get in the car, go down the road, and you see it all the time, car accidents. If you don't know, if you close your eyes for the last time, and you're going to wake up in paradise or you're going to wake up in hell, don't leave these doors until you talk to myself or one of the deacons at the door. As we close, it's not I, but who? But he. It's Christ alone and faith alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for this passage of Scripture, Father, to reflect upon it. Everything that we have is because of you. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for shedding your blood on that cross for us. Father, help us to share the message of reconciliation, to share the gospel, the grace of God to the lost. Help us to walk in newness of life. Help us to encourage each other day by day. Help us to use our gifts that you've given us to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor Aaron. We're going to close our service by singing 150. If you please grab your hymnals and stand and turn to 150. I remember Calvary. Calvary.